Whether in your personal or business relationships, I'm sure everyone hopes that there will never be a day when you feel you have been wronged by someone and you need to look to the courts for compensation or some other type of remedy. But there may be real issues preventing or limiting you from pursuing your claim. Perhaps you don't know the identity of the person who may have defrauded you or who leaked your company's confidential information or who may have ruined your reputation. Perhaps you don't have the documents to prove what was done. What can you do? To help us answer that question, our guest today is Mrs. Julian Mays Cox, a partner at Duncox Attorneys at Law. Good afternoon and welcome to The Edge, Julian. Good afternoon, Diana. Pleasure joining you again on the legal landscape. Well, and good afternoon to all your listeners. Welcome, welcome. Always look forward to, to your directions in this segment. Uh, Julian, let me ask on behalf of everyone, is there a legal way to identify an anonymous wrongdoer? Well, yes, there is, Dion. But firstly, let me just say that what I'm going to focus on is the civil court where one person sues another and not the criminal court. And secondly, what is said here is no substitute for seeking your own legal advice regarding any individual case. But that being said, Dion, a fundamental question before you can sue is, of course, who are you suing? Suppose you're being defamed by some anonymous blog on social media, or as you said, you're having your confidential information leaked, but you don't know who is responsible. Or you know the person, but you don't have crucial information to support your case. Well, the court can, where appropriate, make what I would call in this segment an unmasking order. But it's actually referred to as a Norwich Pharmacal Order. The court has the power, in its discretion, of course, to force another person or a company who may have unknowingly or quite innocently been mixed up in the fraud or some other wrongdoing to, to compel them to produce to you documents and information that are relevant to the wrongdoing or that allow you to unmask and reveal the identity of the perpetrator. Sad, sad state that we have to look at doing this, but then we're going to have to do it. So we need you to give us some examples of where un, an unmasking order may be useful. Well, Dion, let's think about um, these lottery scams that have been in the news, you know. We've all heard about popular scams in, popular scams in Jamaica, a caller uh, where calls are maybe made to strangers telling them that they've won the lottery. Mm-hmm. The caller then asks the stranger to send some cash to a bank account to whatever no, um, basis, to transfer a fee, for instance, so the winnings can be sent. However, after that transfer fee is paid, the stranger never hears from that caller again. In that case, an unmasking order may help with obtaining information from the telephone company, for instance, which identifies who, who, who which identifies who. Is, who is the owner of the scammer's phone? Or it may help with obtaining information from the bank to, say, identify who owns the bank account where the transfer fee was sent. So unmasking orders have been utilized in a variety of circumstances, such as this year. The instances in which a court may grant such an order are open to the discretion of the court. And I'm going to give you a couple more examples where an unmasking order may be sought. So, for instance, against custom where you want to stop unknown importers from importing counterfeit goods into the country, but you don't know the identity of those those importers. Uh, Against a bank to disclose account information in circumstances where money was wired to the wrong account based on a fraudulent email, or against a print and publisher who quite unwittingly printed an article in a company's journal that made defamatory statements damaging of someone's reputation but the injured party does not know the identity of the article's author. And finally, an unmasking order may also reveal the identity of the fraudster who, unknown to a registered landowner, pretended to be him or her and transferred his or her land to innocent purchasers who knew nothing about the fraud. And you need to find out the identity of that fraudulent so-called quote-unquote vendor. And there are other examples, Sam. Hmm. All right, and, and I guess we just have to bear in mind that it is what it says, unmasking Repeating, order. Yeah. Yes, yes. But I have to ask you then now, Julian, are there any limitations in asking the court for an unmasking order? 
that we should be aware of? Uh, there are limitations, Dion. Uh, it really depends on the specifics of each case. But I'll give you one example. The court will want to make sure that the unmasking order is truly being sought against a person or even a company that has actually been mixed up in or involved or implicated in the wrongdoing. Help to facilitate it happening in some way, although, importantly, did so quite innocently. And the example, the ready example is the bank money being transwired to a, a bank account and the bank holding those funds quite innocently, unknowingly, and not against a person who was just a mere witness or observer, someone who facilitated or involved was involved or mixed up in the wrongdoing. That is an important limitation. That's important as well. So if we unknowingly, or if okay, I got you, I got you. Um, what if you get an unmasking order and find the wrongdoer? Is there anything stopping him or her, her. from emptying that bank account and sending the money overseas once? they learn that you've tracked them down? Well, of course, each case has to be looked at carefully, Dion, but the court does have a discretion to freeze the assets of a defendant at the beginning of a lawsuit and in urgent cases even after the lawsuit, even before, I should say, the lawsuit is filed. Such orders are known as freezing orders and may be quite helpful in ensuring that at the end of the day, when you are successful in getting your judgment, that judgment is not left completely or partially unsatisfied. Now, one important requirement, though, in applying for a freezing order is to show that there is reason to believe that there is a real risk that the defendant will deal with his or her assets in Jamaica, or even in certain cases outside of Jamaica, in such a way that those assets are unlikely to be available to you in the future to satisfy a possible judgment. Now, what, what do I mean by dealing well, dealing with assets just refers to actions such as removing them from Jamaica, selling them, or if so, spending the money, giving assets away, mortgaging your property, and so on. Um, it should be noted that there are some limitations, such as the defendant may still be allowed to pay reasonable legal fees in relation to the lawsuit from those frozen assets and make mortgage payments where that was a pre-existing obligation before the freezing order was in effect. Uh, yeah, I just want to mention quickly, mm -hmm. um, if I have time, another type of order, if I may, that may also be useful in this scenario, where the wrongdoer has been identified, as we said, but he or she is in possession of the documents or property you need to support your case. Then that element of surprise is important, so the wrongdoer doesn't have time to get rid of the incriminating evidence. Mm -hmm. So where appropriate, the court can also grant what is called a search order. And if the situation is urgent, can even do so before you file the lawsuit, just as, as with the freezing order and the unmasking order. Mm -hmm. That order allows premises to be searched and relevant documents and property seized where there is a serious risk that the documents or property may be destroyed once the wrongdoer gets wind of your lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So an example is where you claim someone has breached your copyright. Mm -hmm. and there, but, but, but it's the wrongdoer that has the relevant information to prove it. And it's stored on, say, for instance, the possible defendant computer system. And so the computer hardware and storage devices and so on may be removed mm -hmm. in order to search, inspect, and take copies of the material that's needed to prove your case in court. You, you've, um, you've been so helpful. And I know there's a lot more to this that maybe yes, we, could, we could explore. But again, maybe the details would depend on each individual case as needed. It but it's definitely something to go back to. Any, any hashtag did you know before we go, though? Uh, yes, quickly. I thought this was an interesting one. Your listeners may be interested to know that our masking order was used to force Facebook to reveal the identity of the person who caused the permanent deletion of a deceased gentleman's profile. And with it, all his posted materials. Uh, the, the person who applied for the unmasking order had been in this long-term relationship with the gentleman and was certainly distressed since the deletion meant the loss of those memorable posts. Mm. They had refused uh, to reveal the identity of who gave it those instructions. So an unmasking order may even be used in those, I guess you could say, unconventional ways. <laughs> but it's there for us to use if we need. So okay. thank but you so known, for think, It is good to yes. know. Yes. Um, and it's been good having you as well. Julian Mays Cox, a partner at Duncox Attorney, Attorneys at Law. Thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. It's been a pleasure.
Thank you. See you next week. Yes. All right, we'll do it again next week. And we want you to be here as well. We cover so many topics on the legal landscape.